Greg Travis on the fishbowl. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. How are Great, great to finally have you on. We've had a lot of uh, mishaps. First, there was snow. Then there was issues with my editors. Um, but uh, finally, you were you were swimming in the fishbowl. <laughs> Hopefully, not uh, swimming in snow. Hopefully, no, no, there's no. water in the fishbowl. Yeah, yeah. Now, does the water have chlorine and fluoride in it, or is it fresh, more spring-like water? Uh, fresh spring-like water. Oh, good, good. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm a free fish. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> well, good. So, um, you had a lot of bad weather there recently? Yeah, well, it's it's been so crazy. Like, like basically, we've had, it's either been really, really cold for a few days, and then it gets back into, like, the fifties or sixties. Wow. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, it does. It this whole winter has like, it, it has not made up its mind whether it wants to be winter or spring. Um, and now I hear like we had a little bit of snow last night, and then it was like forty or fifty degrees today, and uh, and then I hear a few days from now we're looking for it to be around the seventies. Oh, man. I know. It's so fluctuating and changes so quickly nowadays. It's really, really strange. Um, and the reason they change the term to climate change is because some places are colder and other places are hotter. And so it's hard to gauge if the planet is cooling or actually warming up. They're not sure. Right. It can go either way. So they <laughs> used to be global warming and now... They change it to climate change because they don't know what's going on, you know? Right. Well, I think I read a recent statistic study that said um, the North Pole is melting, but the South Pole is growing larger. Mm-hmm. And they thought the North Pole was melting for a while with certain glaciers, and then they came back. And so they weren't sure what that meant. So it's right. fluctuating in a very strange way, but who knows? Don't you know that uh, if you watch YouTube, the Earth is flat anyway? I mean, it's exactly. all the rage, the flat exactly. Earth theory. It's all over the place. Exactly. Like the Earth Pir is flat Pirates now. of the Caribbean proved that we can literally, you know, take a pirate ship and fly off, you know, the, the edge of the, the uh, <laughs> ocean and everything. So... <laughs> There's an ice wall around the edge. It's a big, big, huge ice wall. Yeah, that's quite an interesting. I've got a buddy of mine on Facebook that's got a concave Earth theory that supposedly the Earth is on the inside of a ball and that the universe is like the center of that ball and so that uh, all the land is like within the inside of a ball. It's a very unusual uh, theory. It's pretty interesting, actually. I, I always liked uh, the ending to the first two Men in Black movies. Um, especially the first one where we're just, we're just a, a Marvel planet in a, a larger, you know, alien, you know, existing being, uh, sacrament and whatnot, you know? So, oh, right, right. Yeah. Like it pulls back and it's right. just like in this little, uh, piece of jewelry or something. Right. Right. It's like, yeah, a yeah. Sacrament. I remember that now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You never know. You never know. Or there's a lot of theories that we could be a, um, you know, digitally generated um, hologram. That the whole thing could be uh, zeros and ones, and that uh, you know the technology got so advanced that they're actually uh, you know projecting this reality in some sort of a uh, you know computer. Right, like the you Matrix. The, the, right, we, exactly. We could be exactly. in the Matrix right now. Yeah. <laughs> We're all uh, laying in, uh, you know, some kind of a, uh, a tube with tubes coming out of us, and this is all a dream. Yeah. Right. You know, know. that uh, that steak I ate last night is really just recycled human being. <laughs> Soy and green. So I grew exactly. up with all those movies, uh, all those sci-fi movies in the seventies. I was a big movie buff, so I was always going to see all the movies that would come out. And uh, 
yeah, some of that stuff is uh, coming true. All the 70s sci-fi stuff is starting to play out in uh, kind of a freaky way nowadays. You yeah. never know. You know some well, Charlton Heston. Tra- Charlton Heston is one of my favorite um, sci-fi. Like, he's like my probably the first like sci-fi actor that we had. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, Planet of the Apes, Beneath Planet of the Apes, debatably, you know, which one is better. Uh, yeah. Then uh, Swollen Green, The Omega Man, which is really the the second uh, adaptation of I Am Legend. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I think that one's the best. E- even though I Am Legend with Will Smith was decent, um, I still like the Charlton Heston one better. Yeah, I do too. I mean, it was a much cheaper version, and it didn't have the uh, the scope and the bigness. But for some reason, there was a creepiness to it that the yeah. Will Smith version didn't have. It was very dark and creepy, and I remember just being kind of scared when I first saw it. You know, right, right. It's kind of kind of creepy and scary. You know, as to where the I think there was so much bright light in the Will Smith version that it kind of opened it up and it wasn't as scary. And the CGI creatures were a little bit over the top. That's what I thought. They were a little bit too much. They're almost like, you know, wild animals. Right, right. Creepy, uh, nuclear, uh, you know, different creatures. I'm I'm studying screenwriting at Point Park University here in Pittsburgh. And Mm -hmm. in terms of like, this, like, like, I Am Legend was like a blockbuster. And the Omega Man was a better story. Um, I thought that, you know, the fact that the the creatures that were really us just mutated, um, that the fact that they chose not to use weapons of, like, guns and tanks and what's left over from um, true humanity and rather use, like, man-made weapons to try and kill Neville where Neville, all he had to do was take his high-powered rifle out, you know, and and snipe him, you know. But it was in, in you know, the, oh, what is the actor's name that plays the leader of uh, of the the mutant group? Um, I forget his name, but he's been in a lot of sci-fi stuff um, over the years. Uh, one of my, he's one of my favorite sci-fi genre actors. But um, it that that film in general just has a better story to tell versus Iron Legend just purely being about we're going to make this a pure blockbuster movie. Yeah, yeah. And they actually shot the creatures both ways. They shot a practical version and they shot them um, with the CGI and then they, and they, or they did them with the CGI and they decided to go with the CGI version later. But they actually shot them with practical actors playing those roles as well. So, I don't know. I guess it was some sort of studio decision. And that that's what I hear was the same thing with uh, the prequel they did to John Carpenter's The Thing and uh, the late, great Wes Craven's Curse movie. Um, they all had, like, a lot of mainly practical effects. And some and this, it was like a studio's call last minute to change the majority of it to, um, well, in Curse case, all of it, to CG. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the problem is um, the studios want everything to be likable and safe to project to the biggest commercial success they can get out of a movie. But the problem is that's not always the best bet. You know, I was reading about the changes they made in the Mel Gibson film Payback, which was a knockoff of the of the original thing called uh, Point Blank with uh, Lee Marvin. Right. And the Lee Marvin version was so serious and so tough and so period and, and just all the people in it, you believed that that was really going on. But in the Mel Gibson version, it was just kind of light and fluffy and everybody was kind of joking around, and he was being real smug and real sort of like, you know, picky. And you just didn't, it was too movie esque. You just didn't believe any of this stuff was actually happening. You know, it all seemed like a big movie. And so they wanted it to be more light and fun and like a fun action film. 
And to me, that just kind of screwed it all up, you know? Yeah, I, I that's have, not what it was meant. That's not what that story was about. You know? Right. I have seen the director's cut of Payback. And yeah, that's what they were talking about. There was a little bit more... Yeah. A little bit more serious with the director's cut, but still, you know... Yeah, he still had that, you know, wise-cracking attitude. Um, yeah. But it, it, had, it did have an entirely different ending. And... Um, the the Chris Christopherson character um, did not exist. It was a woman who was uh, in charge of everything, and it was it was, it was I think it was also a bit longer. Um, mm-hmm. There was a lot there was a lot better uh, story development in the director's cut, and I I was like I didn't realize like sometimes with director's cuts it can be an entirely different movie, like with Alien Three. Um, Entirely different. Oh, I never saw a director's cut of that. I didn't see a cut of it. I don't know. Well, I probably saw the studio cut of that, too. Huh. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Um, Alien 3, the director's cut, is like legitimately an entirely different movie. Um, really? Wow. Yeah, it seems like a lot going on in that movie. There's so much going on. And I bet it was a really difficult film to cut because... It seemed like they had a lot of subplots and a lot of little things going on. They just couldn't figure out how to put it all together in a cohesive way. Yeah, I, I remember watching like the uh, special features because I I started out having the Alien Quadrilogy on DVD, and mm-hmm. since they put out the Alien Anthology on Blu-ray, I now own that, which gives me um, all four theatrical and director's cuts plus special features and whatnot. And um, they said that Alien 3 had the most trouble um, out of all the Alien movies because first um, they were talking about in the first draft of the script or something, it was not even um, a penal colony. Um, It was like a a monastery, a planet where there was like a a monastery of monks that um, Ripley is like... Again, she's the only one that's supposed to survive, but instead of it being like, you know, pr- pr- prison and on a planet, it's it's like a monastery. And then they switched it to um, the prison, and then um, there was like a lot of different stuff going on in there. But the the director's cut really again better story development, and it, it explains like a lot more with what was going on. And mm-hmm. instead of it being a dog that the um, face hugger attaches itself to, it's like a cow, um, which, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, they have more also uh, actual like practical effects with the xenomorph and everything. And it's, it's a, it's a really interesting take on it. Cause I didn't realize like, it's literally an entirely different movie. Um, but the problem is with all of these follow-ups and and even an original movie is that it's keeping the line of tension. If you look at the original alien, that is one thing that it does from the very beginning to the end of the movie. Right. Is it keeps a line of tension with connecting with you and the movie, the audience member and the viewer with really wanting to know what's around the corner, what's going to happen next, who's going to get killed next, what's going to happen at the end, you know. And that's the hardest thing to get across to a lot of filmmakers and a lot of writers is that, you know, you go off on these excursions and these little little detours along the way, you're losing your line of tension, you know. We have to have everything that's in place enhance that line of tension so that, it builds on that, and then it builds on that. You know, that's what Hitchcock was so good at, is everything build on that line of tension, you know. Right, right. I mean, you know... Because, you know, as soon as you lose that, they want to go and get popcorn, or they want to go in the bathroom. I'm sure you've been sitting in a movie, and you've been, giving, you've been heavily engrossed in the story, and you're right there with it, and then all of a sudden it goes to some old lady walking in the park for like, you know, a 10-minute scene, and you're going, what the hell is this all about, you know? Yeah, yeah. And now you've got to start over again, and you've got to like get their attention again, and now you've got to pick up where you left off before you went on this major detour that didn't have anything to do with anything, you know? Right. I mean, like you know, so, um, I'm I was having kind of like 
an issue with uh with my senior thesis script that I was working on uh last semester with the first draft and um it's like it's a it's focusing on the Native American legends of skinwalkers and um I had it's you know a, a story to tell but I didn't have you know the right inspiration to tell the story and when I saw you know the 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 revenant um it, it totally like you know gave me everything I needed to be like all right I'm ready to you know totally rewrite this thing for senior thesis mm -hmm. too which I'm in right now and I'm currently uh working on but you know we we read pages in class aloud and everything like 10 pages um every week and um you know two weeks in a row well actually three weeks in a row I've just gone back and worked on rewriting um 10 pages or 20 pages you know total of like what I've been working on because um it's like what you said the the first 20 minutes you know is like is what captures an audience and are they going to be in for the rest of the ride and right. if, if they don't have that then you know they will some will stay because they've paid the money but that's when they go get the popcorn that's when you know they they go to the bathroom because you know they've they've lost interest mm -hmm. I think the Revenant, you know, I know they wanted to open with a bang, and they did open with a hell of a battle scene with the Indians and everything, but the original film was based on a Richard Harris uh, film, Man in the Wilderness, I believe, you know, or it was from the same book or something right. to that effect. I'm not sure what, but it was basically the same story. I don't remember if he was mauled by a bear or if he just fell down a hill or he might have been attacked by an animal of some kind. I don't remember, but I remember seeing the movie a while back. And they set up the guy's character much better at the beginning. And they set up the whole, like, you know, kind of uh, conflict with the members of the camp and the hunting party much better before they had the battle with the Indians and before he got, you know, lost in the woods and all that. Which in this one... We really didn't have the setup of the character. We had a, like a little scene of him hunting with the other guy before all hell breaks loose. And then they just kind of threw in some shots of him and the wife and the kid at the very beginning of the movie before they really started the credits. They threw in a few shots to kind of, I don't know, to kind of give his character some sort of a family situation and that he was, you know, the good guy, I guess. But that whole beginning and that whole thing, I think, was a little bit rushed. I think they would have been better off to set it up a little bit more. Maybe spend less time with him in the wilderness uh, towards the end of the second act and, like, set up the first act a little bit more, establish his character at the beginning a little bit more as the good guy, and then do the battle and then go into all that. Because I didn't... I felt like we didn't know him well enough to care about him that much by the time, you know, all that happened to him. Yes, we know he's Leonardo DiCaprio, but who is he in the movie? Who is I can I can definitely you know? agree with that. Um yeah. I can I can definitely agree with that. I, I like I, I, I was in because it was DiCaprio and Tom Hardy. Um, right, of course. You know, yeah. like, but those are the actors. Those are the actors. But I'm talking right. about strictly right. the story right. on the, the as far as the, the characters go. The yeah. Right, as far yeah. as the characters go, I, I guess I can't agree that because it was DiCaprio and Tom Hardy, everybody was in. But the the, the characters themselves, um, Tom Hardy's character had way, 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 way more character development, and in. in uh, the, the few moments that we see him versus mm -hmm. where most of it is DiCaprio, um, you know, surviving in the wilderness, trying to get back to kill him. Um, but DiCaprio himself, it's like, we, we know he's like, he's, he's, he can handle himself in the wilderness, but the, the relationship with the son and all that, it's like, okay, you know, I can buy that, you know, he, he had, he's, he's white, had, you know, Indian wife, they had a half-breed child, um, you know, in the times already, that's like tough to deal with. Um, but 
yeah, they could have they could have definitely taken maybe you know ten minutes at the beginning to show you know him living with them, um, eating dinner, and then he gets called to go, and then they go straight into you know flash forward. There, that's where it opens basically right. with them being attacked and all that. Yeah, I mean, if there were just even a, like a five-minute section of the development of like him leaving his family and taking the son with him and leaving the wife and then, you know, going down the river and the boat and then hunting a little bit and then all of a sudden they're in this situation, we would have, in, within that, it would have given us a little bit more time to get to know Leo a little bit, you know. Right. And, uh, and, and because he was out of it, Tom Hardy kind of took over the movie with his character because he was the only one doing any talking or doing anything, you know, when they went to save him and found him and he had to stay back with him. It was like kind of his movie from there on out, you know? Right. But, um, there was something missing in the overall power of the thing. I think the ending was a little Hollywood force of the standoff that they ended up doing. Maybe something a little different that wasn't so cliche about them finally catching up with one another and just having an individual standoff with each other was a little bit Hollywood, I think, you know? In the Richard Harris version, he finally catches up to the group and doesn't do anything. He finally just forgives him and lets it go. And uh, they go about their, you know, their trip back, which is probably a little bit more of a realistic way it would have ended. Not saying that would have been the better way, but something right. a little bit more unusual that might have, uh, you know, taken a twist, uh, you know, than just this, like, wrestling match that it ended up being. But anyway, it was a great film. I mean, the way they did it, and the, 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 the scenery, and the, the photography, and everything about it was really, really well done. You know? I'm right. surprised it didn't win Best Picture. Just because it was so much better than everything else, you know. Spotlight was a good script and a good little interesting movie of the week, but certainly compared to the Rebel, and it didn't even come close to being the kind of movie, you know, best picture material. Right. I don't think, you know, I really don't. I mean, you know, the, in in my opinion, the only two movies that came out last year that you know had a chance at um, being a uh, what best director I thought was Mad Max and The Revenant. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, thought, I actually thought Mad Max would win best director because right. they gave it to that other guy last year for the Bird right. Man, you know? Right. And I thought with the older Academy that they would give it to George Miller because, my God, what an incredible job for a 70 year old to come back right. and do. I mean, it's, you know, it was an amazing movie. Well, I mean, yeah. and honestly, in in my opinion, I thought it was a better. It was, it was a better film in terms of how it was directed. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it just really was. I mean, The Revenant was great because there were some shots where you're like, you know, how how does it just keep continuing? Um, but you know, technologically. And and the way um, George Miller was able to use uh, center frame um, mm -hmm. on on the camera to shoot every single scene in that movie in center frame, which um, like my 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 screenwriting teacher showed me this on YouTube and explained like why people can literally not take their eyes away from Mad Max the entire way through, even though it's basically a non-stop chase movie. And mm -hmm. um, the reason that is, is because George Miller at age, you know, 70, you know, having as many years um, experience in the industry directing, you know, so many different He also films. got to prep that movie for right. about 10 years. Right. Because they were going to do it 10 years ago. So he's I been remember. knowing for about 10 yeah. years. Yeah, I was, was going to do this film, and uh, so right. he had a lot of prep time on it. Right, know? right, and I, I, I've been following like you know the rumors of Mad Max Fury Road since you know since ten years ago. You know, I was like, yeah, when yeah. I saw that it's actually yeah. going to happen, I was like, is this for real? Uh huh. You know, because there was so many like. I guys. actually think that it could have worked just as well if they'd have used Mel Gibson and I maybe think so you know. Too. 
put a wig on him and younged him up a little bit right. and made him up a little bit, I think right. it would have been great. I think so, you know? too. I mean, Tom Hardy, again, is, is great because he can literally be an entirely different person in any yeah. role he chooses. I mean, but... he was good. He was okay. Right. But, boy, right. I sure, I thought, you know, an older Mel would have been that's, fine. That's, in that's, that what story. I, that's what I That's what I I don't know why there would have been a problem with that, other than maybe the studio marketing people. I don't know. Right. You know? Right, I mean, you know, he, uh, you know, he was great. I mean, Road Warrior is still my favorite, but yeah, but, yeah. but Mad Max Fury Road probably comes second, then Thunderdome, then the original Mad Max. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, George Miller shot Fury Road in center frame every single shot, and basically what that does is it attracts um, the audience's eyes the way the camera is set up. And it translates um, onto the screen that their eyes are um, basically uh, glued to the screen on every single shot because it's focused on where it needs to be. And mm -hmm. that's that's that fact alone that he was able to do that with every single shot in like a two hour hmm. movie, you know, is pretty amazing. So by you're saying by centering everything, the audience doesn't have to look around for to find what right. they're looking for. Right. It's just automatically right there. It, you know? Yeah, it automatically attracts it to where it needs to be. Right, right. I didn't even realize that about that film. Yeah, I thought the um, I haven't seen it in two D, but I thought the three D aspect of it was just okay. Yeah, I didn't remember the. I, I saw it in three D, and I was like, "Eh, this movie could work probably better in two D." I, I saw uh, it both. Yeah, I haven't seen it in two D. I haven't got the DVD yet or the Blu Ray, but uh, I will. Um, I thought it, you know, it, it, it was basically a chase. I thought it got bogged down a little bit towards the end of Act Two when they found the older women camp. Yeah, yeah. And it seemed like they didn't know where they wanted to go with that. They were right. doing a lot of standing around talking for a long period of time and I didn't understand why they were, you know, wasting so much time with that. It seemed like it should have been a little bit more urgent or something. But right. Yeah, it was a, you know, after that it picked up and uh, ran to the end. But uh yeah, but, but, really, really but good. if you look at like all the Mad Max movies, they, mm -hmm. they all of them pretty much do that. Um do they? Yeah. Yeah, like like Matt well Mad Max one, you know, I mean, the opening chase scene is amazing, and the mm -hmm. and the end chase scene is amazing, and the the middle is just really really slow. Um, yeah, yeah. Road Warrior, it picks up with like an awesome opening. Um, you, you're in for the ride, you know, it, it, it and then by the midpoint, it just kind of it, it it drags a little bit, and then they get on the chase scene with the truck, and it picks right back up again. Um, yeah, Thunderdome yeah. does the same thing, like, you know, the opening where he's in Barter Town, then he gets, you know, sentenced, you know, into the wasteland on the mm -hmm. horse, and then he meets mm -hmm. the, the kids, and it's like, what is going on here? And then they go back to Barter Town, and there's the end chase scene, it's like, alright, I'm in again, you know, and... Bad, well, bad. I felt like in the uh, in the last, I mean, the third one, that there weren't any cars until the very end of the movie. Because we were stuck in the border town, and we were stuck in the beginning. It didn't seem like there was any car. Maybe there was a chase scene at the beginning. I don't know. There wasn't a chase scene. What happened was, because people, he was, at that point, like, most people had run out of gas. So right, that's was, what it was. Right, so he was weren't using. There like, weren't there, like, vehicles with horses? Yeah, he, was, he had, like, like camels um, dragging his vehicle, and right. the, the gyro captain yeah. and, and his son um, like heisted his vehicle from him, and that's when he followed it to Barter Town, and he made the deal with Auntie Anne, um, Tina Turner, uh, to basically take out Master Blaster. Um, oh right! So right. he could get his stuff back, but when basically <laughs> he was going to kill Master Blaster, and he saw that really the Big Oaf was like a you know mentally challenged yeah. guy. He was like, you know, yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. He, he couldn't do it. And that's when he got, you know, sentenced and, you know, Auntie Anne killed him anyways. And they, they took over Barter Town. Well, I mean, the, the thing about it is on this particular time, the studios were right. The Mad Max series did have a built in audience. Right. And, uh, 
uh, for them to come back and do a sequel this many years later, I don't know when the last one was done. Nineteen eighty-five. Well, there you go. Eighty-five. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, God, that's thirty years. Yeah. You know, and for them to come back, they've been on television so much, and I guess there's video games and all kinds of other. You know, I, I, that's that's all I'm playing whatnot. right now is the Mad Max game. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they were right to, to do a follow-up with it, and they got really lucky to get him to do that follow-up, because it could have been, with another director, could have easily been a disaster. Right. So, uh, yeah, speaking of 30 years ago, that's when I made my movie, Dark Seduction, in 84, and then we shot a little bit more in 85, and uh, it was the one that got away. I did it with a partner. And he tried to finish the film and the editing off flatbed and we did it in 16 millimeter and it was just, we couldn't get the cut right. And um, so finally I transferred it over to three quarter and I worked on it a long time on the three quarter system, trying to find the cut. And, uh, and then in the early nineties, I got the film back from him. And I almost finished it then, and then the sound company I was working with, we were doing the sound on original Pro Tools, and then they went out of business, and so they left all my stuff in a box in the garage. So I got that back, and then I just kind of like had to take a break from it for a while. And then I gave it to a negative cutter to cut the negative, and then he had a stroke and retired and disappeared, so the film was with him for eight years. So it's just one thing after another. Every time I would go back and try to finish it, something would stop me. Something would block me. And so I just couldn't get back into it for a long time. Finally, I did midlife, and I um, you know, had my production company set up, and I had a lot of people that were helping me at the time. And So I said, you know, if I can get this film back, this would be a good time to finish it, because I'm now set up to do that. And so I finally tracked down the daughter of the negative cutter and I uh, asked her to, you know, find the film and, you know, she didn't know where it was and they had no clue and I, you know, was it lost? Did he even have it anymore? Who knew? So finally they looked in the garage and they couldn't find it and they, two or three times they looked around the house, couldn't find it. And so I called my psychic friend, Tana Marie Richards, and I asked her, I said, is this thing gone? Is it lost forever? And she said, no, it's in a little cabinet in the corner of the garage in the bottom shelf. So I begged the son-in-law to look one more time, and sure enough, that's where it was. She called it right on the money, and that's where they found all the negative reels and the work print and everything. And so uh, he took it to work with him the next day, and I ran down there and picked it all up, and I said, well, all right, the film gods gave me the film back. Now I guess I owe it to, to you know, the film gods to finish it. So, <laughs> so after that, I started slowly but surely putting everything together and finishing it. But shooting on film and doing it that way back those days, very difficult, very difficult. Today it's so much easier to make a film on digital and pop it right onto a hard drive, sync up your sound with your footage and your editing program, and then you're ready to go. All you have to do is cut it, you know? But back then, you had all the sound mag that you had to transfer, and then you had to cut the sound mag, the mag that matched the picture, and every time you make a cut in the picture, it throws the soundtrack out of sync, so then you have to re-sync up the soundtrack. It's a freaking nightmare. And it's such a slow process. Oh, my God. It takes forever to do anything. So even though I love film, and this film looks great in black and white negative, I mean, it just we did a 2K transfer from the negative, and it looks really, really good. So, I mean, I do love film. But it's a much better medium. Right. It looks much better. It's softer. It's, it's got more depth. It's got more textures to it. It's just, you know, I don't know how to explain it to young people. I'm like, this film just feels and looks like a movie to me. I don't know how it is. Maybe it's because I grew up on film and that's what I'm used to. But hey, I, I'm, I'm I'm 1988, so <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in there. I'm in there. Yeah, I I just still love it, and uh, you know, I'm contemplating shooting my next movie on film, even if it's Super 16, because you transfer it to digital anyway. But at least you've got that film work as a foundation, 
to start out with. I, I'm I'm in complete agreement. Um, you know, there's there's cool stuff you can do with digital that you can't do with film, like yeah. like the way um, Michael Mann shot. Uh, was it was it Michael Mann that did? Um, uh, was that that Tom Cruise film? Yeah, they shot at night and all those night yeah. shots they yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He like, shot part of that on film though. Right. Just the night stuff he shot on digital at the time because right. it was an earlier version of the right. Of the digital and, and, and that uh, film, you know. that 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 movie has a great look to it, um, mm. but but it's like you just said, you know, he was he shot it originally on film, and the night stuff was just added digitally, you know, yeah. and and like all the the eighties and and nineties like horror sci fi stuff, which is probably like you know where I get all my inspiration for my own writing. Mm -hmm. Um, it just, it looks, it looks better than stuff that is strictly digital. Um, th there's just something about film versus digital that yeah. makes it look more real, you know? Yeah. And you know, I started all my shorts. I got one of those Panasonic cameras way back in the early eighties, uh, which was the consumer model. First, we had three-quarter, and so we did some things on three-quarter in college because we had access to the three-quarter editing and cameras in school. But then when the Panasonic came out, both my and my partner, David, who lived in New York, he got one first, and then he got the little half-inch editing equipment to go with it. So we would shoot our little videos on VHS, and then we'd cut them on VHS. And uh, that was where we started making one after another, so I grew up with, you know, first doing movies on Super 8 with the sound stripe. I did a couple of features that way with the Super 8 with sound. And then when we started doing the videos, then we made a bunch of shorts because they were real easy to, to do. And you didn't have to pay for developing and you could edit it easily. And, you know, so I grew up working with video. And, and digital is just an extension of video. It's just what evolved from video. Uh, I saw it all the way. And so... I've worked with every medium in the between, and I just, you know, I I actually made a feature on video that was right before HD came out, and I was trying everything I could in the color correction to get it to look like film. And the problem is there's a glassiness about the image that you just can't get rid of. I don't know what it is, but it looks like there's a layer of glass over the image, you know, but it's reflecting a little bit too much. Um, the new cameras now, the Alexa and uh, some of the Reds, they're not too bad about that. They've sort of softened the image a little bit. But the problem with it is that it's a very sharp image and everything is in focus and everything is ultra sharp, you know. Right. Especially with the 4K and the 6K, it's almost too much. It's like overload on your senses, you know. Like you were talking earlier, you want to center something or you want to pinpoint something that you want the audience to look at, but if everything is clean and clear and in focus, it's almost too much, you know? Right. And uh, I think that is part of the problem with digital, but, you know, for sports events, and for certain other things on TV, and I think TV shows, maybe it's fine. Maybe it's perfect. But for a movie, there's a fantasy element of, like, bringing the audience into this world. And if it looks like video, if it looks like a TV show, you're not accomplishing that, tech, you're not accomplishing that task of creating another world, you know? Right. Uh, it just looks like mm, there's something cheap about it. There's something that's not expensive about the way it looks. I mean, I was watching Blade Runner last night it's on Netflix, and it was a theatrical release with the god awful narration. <laughs> but still, the look of the film, I, know, I don't think they've been able to even match it today with all the new CGI and all the new technology. They haven't come close to anything that looks like Blade Runner. Blade I mean, Runner is. is probably up there in my one of my top five favorite sci-fi films ever um I know. Ridley just, Scott. And I didn't, I, when it first came out i you know i thought it was great 
but it, it's such a melancholy kind of laid back right. sort of movie that it just you didn't quite know what to make of it when you first saw it. But now you realize, oh, it's a it's a takeoff on all the forties film noir. Right. It's a film noir. I, I actually had to do a uh, presentation on film noir last semester for mm -hmm. uh, one of my classes and. Um, talking about a film we were talking about earlier, Soylent Green. Um, Soylent mm -hmm. Green was the first of the Blade Runner kind. Um, the the sci-fi film noir, which is which right. is the the genre that um, Soylent Green spawned. But Blade Runner is like the is definitely the definition of sci-fi film noir. Um, yeah, he even went as far as having costumes, right, right. like the dresses that Sean Young and the hairstyles right. that a lot of them have were right out of the 40s film noir, right, so exactly. he was definitely tipping his hat, and, and he had Harrison Ford in the suit and the overcoat and all that, you know, so and a lot of the other characters were wearing the fedoras, so it was really... And there was another film that was really cool, Until the End of the World. Did you see that one? Uh, I think it was Vim Vendors. It had kind of a Blade Runner S, but not as much production design. It was kind of like a, um, a film noir about, um, um, oh, what's the, I, I want to say, what's the actor? Um, oh, I can't remember his name now, but, um, Anyway, it was all over the world. They shot in like five or six different countries. And it's like uh, three and a half hours long, I think, was the original theatrical cut. But there's like um, a four and a half hour cut, you know, directly. Yeah, cut. I, I have not seen that. I'm going to have to check that, that out. That is a really cool movie to watch. That's got a lot of really neat stuff in it. And it's a film noir. And it's a futuristic. And um, yeah, you should definitely check that out. You'd really like it. Two of the ones that I really liked that were like sci-fi film noir from the 90s, which I actually um, consider the 90s um, a totally different um, genre of, of neo-noir in itself, which I um, kind of created called retro neo-noir, because if mm -hmm. you look at the 90s in general, um, not just with sci-fi, retro sci-fi neo-noir, but retro neo-noir movies in general like basic instinct like um a perfect murder like devil in a blue dress but some of the sci-fi ones were dark mm -hmm. city um and yeah. uh the 13th floor um like those those two movies were like the late 90s i mean really had some great uh concepts going on um mm -hmm. and were definitely like dark city was like it's like a mind trip movie. It's from uh, the director. It's the, I think it's the the next film. Uh, the director that did the Crow. Um, it was like his follow up to the Crow, and it's like a now, really was the Crow early nineties. The very first yeah. one. Yeah, the very yeah, first one. That was like yeah. ninety four. I want to say right, and that had that kind of Blade Runner. Yeah. 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 Dark city, dark futuristic city right. quality right. to it. Very comic book, but not so comic book as being winking at the audience. Right. It actually, the film took itself a little seriously. You know? Very serious. Which yeah. I like. I like when yeah. a film creates a world and takes itself seriously instead of being campy and winking at the audience. And, you know, that's what I was saying earlier about payback. I felt like that's what it was doing right. in certain aspects. Right. It was just like, oh, this is just a Hollywood movie. And, Everybody knows it. We're just having a good time, you know that kind of thing, you know. Right. But uh, yeah, the crow was great. That bad guy, Michael Winslet, is that his name? I think I believe that is. Yeah. Yeah, I've met him a few times, and uh, yeah, he's he's a really great actor, man. That guy's so intense. So yeah, evil. he's he's that movie made me fall in love with him as far as him playing yeah. a villain. Um, yeah, I'm like, he's such he, a great villain. Yeah, that, that was that was great. That that movie was yeah. just great in general. I mean, I had a chance to meet Tony Todd um, at a convention here a few uh, few like two years ago, and I think I'm going to get to meet him again this April. Uh, actually, the day before my birthday. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and he his character in that movie as like uh, Michael Winslet's um, like main henchman in command. 
um, you know, was was great. And Tony Todd in general, I mean, after playing Candyman um, and, and, and his, you know, iconic roles in the horror genre and, and action yeah. genre in general, like, he can play a really great villain. Um, yeah. Too, and just... Um, I don't know the, the the woman's name that was his sister, but she was creepy, you know, with even their relationship in that movie. And, um, you know, I mean, I really would have loved to have seen, you know, Brandon Lee um, thrive from, you know, that movie uh, oh, yeah. if, if he would have survived because it, it really would have, you know, re kind of defined him as an actor and what he could have done instead of being limited to, you know, the cheap, you know, like shoot 'em up action movies that he started out doing. Um, right. Because he, he really that it, was it a sequel to the movie that he got killed on? Was it a sequel to The Crow? No. Or was um, it some it, other it, it movie altogether? The Crow. It was The Crow that he got killed. Oh, it was the original Crow that he yeah. got killed on at the he, end? He was wow. killed. He I, was killed. I thought it was a sequel. No, it was, it was the, the shootout scene um, at, towards the end. Um, mm -hmm. I think he someone accidentally loaded like a real bullet or something, and he got hit. And, um, and you know, the, he died before they finished filming, and yeah. they had to get like a, a stunt double basically to finish out the movie. Um, so like the last bit of the movie is like not him, um, mm -hmm. but most of it is, and it just proves that like he really could have done been something more than limited to just being you know shoot 'em up action star. Yeah, yeah, I was a huge Bruce Lee fan when I was in junior high. I got into martial arts and I'd done a little judo as a little kid, but then I got into karate. And one of the first of all these movies started coming out and one of the first ones was Five Fingers of Death and that was such a departure from anything we were seeing in America that, at the time and then all of a sudden that sort of paved the way for all the Bruce Lee films and uh, they released uh, Fist of Fury and Chinese Connection and then there was one other one, I think The Big Boss and then of course Enter the Dragon came out a little bit later and then he had died uh, you know, by the time Enter the Dragon came out, which probably boosted the business that much even more. Right. But, uh, yeah, it was just such a sad thing because he was such a huge star then, you know, such a phenomena. I mean, everybody was into Bruce Lee. Everybody wanted to go, you know, every kid on the block wanted to go into karate and be Bruce Lee. And everybody had nunchucks. Everybody was getting the nunchucks and trying to figure out how to work them. And, you know, it was really... And I thought it was like yeah, that's just too bad because right. he was such a great guy too. He would have been right. a really good role model for a lot of people. You know? Right, and I, I thought it was also interesting when I watched um, the Bruce Lee story where uh, Jason mm -hmm. Lee played him. Um, mm -hmm. That he was the one that came up with the idea for the show Kung Fu. And, that's right, and that he was supposed to star in right. Kung Fu. He was but, supposed to play the king role, right? And right. To, and they, they wanted a more of an American-looking guy. Right. So that's when he went over to China and said, well, I can't make it in the front door. I'll maybe see if I can make it in the back door. Right. Uh, but it actually turned out to work in his favor and uh, probably became a much bigger star because of it. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's something about those guys that, you got a sense of, I mean, even though they weren't really, you know, Steve McQueen and, you know, the, the guys of the late 60s and early 70s, they are all real people, and they brought a certain interesting personality and their own, like, take on things into the movies that they did, and you got a kind of a sense of who they were, and they were kind of good guys, you know, even though they all had their problems, they were you know, pretty good people. But now, you get a sense of these actors, man, you don't know where they're coming from. You don't know what... It seems to be... They're not authentic. They're not genuine. They don't really have anything to say. They don't believe in anything. It's like, where's the point of view? Where's the point of view? A lot of the points of view in movies now, it's so obscured. 
you know? Right. But you don't get a sense of not only who the lead guy is or where he's coming from morally, but you don't get a sense of where the movie's supposed to be coming from or what it's supposed to be saying, you know? I mean, all these comic book movies, I don't know. I, I just, you know, after about 10 minutes, okay, I got it. I've seen it. I get it, you know? I'm 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 with you on that. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, like the Iron Man's and one yeah, of those. Yeah, I mean, you know, like they they they're good to watch once, you know, and then yeah, you know, you don't need to watch them again. I mean, the the only the only Marvel movies that I've ever gone back and say, you know, one, I want to own these, and two, I will rewatch these, you know, over and over again, are the R-rated ones. Um, and that that was the the original Punisher with Dolph Lundgren, um, the oh. Punisher with Thomas Jane and John. Who my friend uh, and, Mark uh, uh, Goldblatt directed, I believe. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, was the I editor on Showgirls and Starship yeah. Troopers. He became yeah. Bill Holman's editor, but he directed a few things earlier in his career. And, uh, well, he was always an editor. Right, right. I I, I follow his work. I think it was with Canon Films that he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's actually one of my favorite editors. Um, Oh God, he's great. He's so good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would hang out with him and watch him cut the showgirls because he was in the basement of this theater. We were stuck in uh, Tahoe when we were shooting it, and he set up his editing bay in the basement of the theater. So I'd go down there and watch him work and hang out with him, we became fast friends, and, uh, yeah, he's, he's a really cool guy, so, uh, hey, I, I, but, uh, uh, maybe we can get him on the fishbowl, <laughs> hey, hit him up on Facebook, he's on there, yeah, I think I have, I'm not sure if he's on there, like, that, that often, no, he's probably not, his son is Max Goldblatt, too, and, uh, he's also an editor now, but, uh, yeah, I remember when he was just uh, just a fourteen year old coming up. You know, he did a funny short about eighties comedies, teenage comedies. So he did a little parody, a little twenty minute parody about eighties teenager comedies, which was pretty funny. <laughs> he kind of nailed it. There was a lot of those films back then in the eighties. You know, but uh, Anyway, so I'm just uh, preparing for my big world premiere of Dark Seduction, uh, this 30-year-old uh, movie, and uh, I did update the soundtrack quite a bit, and uh, the original cut was about an hour and a half, and when I after I transferred it and started looking at it again, I, I went back and recut, not recut, but I, I tightened up a bunch of it, and I, I changed a few things around, and you know, then tightened it up a little bit. I cut about 10 minutes out of it, and so it's about 81 minutes now. But it, it needed that little tweaking just to be, you know, a kind of a modern feel to it, you know. It still had a little slow, a little bit slow editing style to it, which is what happens when you're cutting on film because you're afraid to cut it too tight because you don't want to go back and put the little piece of film back in there again, so you end, end up cutting it a little wide. Uh, rather than tighter, just to be on the safe side. So. Right. But, uh, yeah, it, it moves really good. It's like a little freight train. It really cooks along, and uh, it's got a lot of great performances by these a uh, lot of comedians that I was friends with at the time. Robert Schemmel is in it. A comedian named Mark Goldstein is very funny in it. And uh, Julie Brown, who I don't know if you remember from the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, oh, yeah. had a little bit of a oh, musical yeah. career. Her homecoming queen's got a gun and a few others and uh, so she's plays one of the one of the victims in it and um so anyway yeah it's um it's 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 really exciting that uh, taking this thing full circle to uh you know to finally complete it and uh and then i'm you know i'm gonna show it to various distributors but also i've got a couple of companies that are interested now so in doing a uh a VOD and DVD release. So. Awesome. And I went back and shot also a documentary of me explaining uh, the whole process that I went through uh, during the shooting and the trying to complete it. 
So I went back to all the locations that we shot in and uh, revisited all the old places and um, interviewed a lot of the, the actors and some of the crew and a lot of the people that were involved in making the film. So I've got to cut together that whole documentary and I'll try to get that done to, uh, to add it to the uh, DVD release, you know. Awesome. You know, to have it. Yeah, to have it go yeah. along with that. So, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's almost there. Very cool. Well, I look forward to uh, purchasing it on DVD and uh, adding it to my Greg Travis collection. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got a uh, new website called GT Film Productions that I just put up that's got all three of my films with uh, trailers and pictures and, uh, and you know, links to any other stuff that might be uh, pertinent. And so um, I've got that up, uh, GT Film Productions. If anybody wants to check out the links, um, there they are. Yeah, we can, uh, if you want, I can um, add the links at the end of uh, the interview when it's edited. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And if people want to like, go to the Facebook page of Dark Seduction and give it a like. That'd be great too. And then they can, and then they'll see what's going on with it as it progresses. You hear that, Fishbowl audience? Go like <laughs> Dark Seduction, Greg Travis on Facebook. Page yes. On Facebook. <laughs> cool. Well, awesome. Well, I had a list of questions to to ask you about various movies you've been in. But uh, mm -hmm. we've uh, we've been on here for about an hour. If you um, want to do that a different time, or um, if you have some time, you know, I'm not I'm not really in a hurry. If you want to do it now, I'm fine. I can do another little. I can go a little bit longer if if you want. Okay. Um, I had. Well, we can skip through some of this stuff. Um, okay. The first one I did want to talk about is uh, Rodney Dangerfield's uh, The Really mm -hmm. Big Show. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like being a part of that and getting to work with Dangerfield? It was great. He, um, he was looking at me for his show. He knew about me. We'd run into each other at the improv. And then he saw me in some other comedy club, I forget, doing The Punk Magician. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that was you. And he said, I'd heard about this bit, but I didn't know it was you. He goes, oh, you got to be on the show. So he just offered it to me right then and there. And uh, then they flew, flew us to Vegas. And as soon as I got to Vegas, they go, Rodney wants to see you in his room right away. And I was like, oh, okay. So I got my girlfriend settled in her, ho in her in our hotel room, and I went up to his room. And he walks right up to me, buck naked. I get to his room and he walks right out of his bedroom, buck naked. And he goes, "We gotta figure out your introduction." And I'm like, "Oh my god, I can't look down. This is so gross." <laughs> and so I sat there and talked to him a little bit about what we should do for my introduction because he he was you know trying to figure out a funny way to bring me on. And so we came up with something about the bachelor being a bachelor and everything and. Uh, but he was a great guy, a real guy's guy, and uh, he liked to party a little bit still, even then. I don't remember how old he was when we did that, but I know he must have been in his mid-60s by then. Right. And, uh, he liked to smoke his pot. and I don't know what else, but uh, he had a gorgeous girlfriend uh, who was a florist, and uh, he hooked up with her later in life, and she was a real sweetheart. I don't know how she put up with him, because he was like a real macho, real kind of tough guy, you know, real jokester. But we got along great. He actually liked me a lot. He brought me back and I did his other special where I played a, an actor in it. And I played an agent and, uh, and some sketch that, uh, that was the beginning of it. And so, uh, yeah, we had always, uh, we always hit it off really well whenever I was in Vegas uh, working and uh, when, he, when I would see him performing, I'd go by and you know, say hello to him and hang out with him a little bit. And, uh, yeah, he was always very cool. He's, he's, he likes comics, you know, he likes comedians. Right. So, yeah. He's, he, he is and will always be, um, one of my top favorite comedians of all time. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, just everything he was in 
movie wise, you know, that in, in the short time that he was, you know, doing films, um, they all have that, you know, some of the eighties ones, you know, are just classic. Um, but I have to say probably like my favorite role that I, I, I've, it's like a bit part, but probably the best part of the movie, which is natural born killers. Um, oh, that's right. I forgot about him doing that. Yeah. And yeah but like, the, the bit that, you know, Oliver Stone has him in, you know, is like so sick and demented gross. But, yeah. but, but because Wasn't it's like him, a TV show or yeah, something? Yeah, like they did it like, like a sitcom, yeah. And he's like a pedophile, like, yeah, a pedophile like, creepy dad, yeah. Like, just scum. And yeah. like, he plays it like so freaking funny. That that it is it is like it's it's like you can't help but like laugh at how like sick and demented the situations are, and <laughs> it's just really really brilliant, you know, how he was able to pull it off. I mean, like the bits where it's like go take a shower, you know, and make sure it's you know a long shower because you know I want to <laughs> like, yeah. yeah clean it up yeah right. I'll be in to see you later yeah it's so right. obvious you know. Yeah. Right. Like, like, you know, yeah. I'm going to go and see my yeah. face for an hour, like, like. Oh, it's so dark. Yeah. Right, right. And, uh, it's just, but, but it was hysterical because it was him doing it and only he could pull it off in that way, you know, and it was, it was just, it was brilliant. Yeah, he brought a kind of certain kind of Jackie Gleason Right. kind of quality to it. Like it was an old classic 60s sitcom right. that really made it, you know, that much funnier and darker and weirder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It was really, really brilliant. Yeah. Some of these comedies, I mean, he was sort of like a Jackie Gleason kind of W.C. Field sort of comedic character, you know, right. one of the very few that we had in the movies, you know, and, right. uh, he wasn't a great actor, but his comedic persona was so strong, it transcended the material and really worked for film, I think, you know. Right, right. You know, like, he, he didn't need to be a good actor because he was a character himself. So Exactly. His character was the thing. And, right. Uh, you know, Caddyshack, I mean, he made that movie. Yeah, Caddyshack. Uh, great right. Caddyshack. Oh, I mean, God, so uh, like, Caddyshack probably has to be Bill Murray and him, like yeah, the two yeah. of them make that movie. And the judge was pretty good too, because without his reactions, without his being, you know, appalled by everything Rodney did, it wouldn't have worked nearly as good, you know. Right. I mean, and, and he was so funny at being upset by him. You know? Right, right. That and made we, it that much better. You know? Right, and we can't forget the Gopher. <laughs> Which I think was an add-on. I don't think that was scripted in there. <laughs> it was some probably Bill Murray, crazy Bill Murray idea. It's, it <laughs> seems like it probably would be. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. Yeah. That, that bit yeah. with, with him and the gopher, like... <laughs> yeah, it's like, what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, he blows sick. up the, the course at the end. <laughs> trying to get it, like... <laughs> That is that's classic. That's classic. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah, I, he was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I did see the trailer for the new Ghostbusters, and mm -hmm. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm I'm an '80s kid, even though it's '88. I'm an '80s kid, and yeah. I, I. It looks like they, they kind of like tried to do it too too much you know like like they kind of overdid it and well you know, you know a lot of things too are like you can do sequels to certain yeah. subject matters that right. work but a lot of things you know i guess the reason the mad max kind of works is because it's in the future right. it's another world it's not right. this world i mean when you've got a subject that's like it was a subject, you know, the ghost hunting and the ghost. It was a, it was a kind of on the cutting edge when the first one came out of the public's interest in all of that. But now, with all the TV shows about ghost hunters and ghost right. busters and ghost 
goes to everything, uh, you know, it's yesterday's news. I mean, it's nothing right. that really is, people are all that excited when they see it on TV every night. Right. Well, the people with infrared cameras running around the house getting all freaked out about, you know, finding a little shadow somewhere. So, I don't know. I mean, there's when a movie comes out that's about something, it, it's a zeitgeist. It fits in a certain period of time, you know. And if it hits, it hits because people are interested in that subject in that particular period of time. You know what I mean? Right. And also, it, it's a comedic team that had a certain yes. comedic style that mm-hmm. that made that those two movies were what they were. And and um you know, I mean it's I guess it's clever trying to make it an all female cast, but Which you know, was mostly Bill Murray. I mean, let's be right. honest. Ghostbusters right. was only funny because Bill Murray was kinda right. funny in those movies. Right. Those movies weren't really that funny. To me they were more about like a charming buddy movie with a new twist right. on it, but they're Ghostbusters, you know. Right, exactly. Like, I mean, Ghostbusters. I mean, they weren't like dark. a drop down hilarious. Right. Like, oh, this is so funny. I mean, it's more like an action film, you know. Right. I mean, Ghostbusters Two was downright dark. Um, oh, okay, yeah. You know, like I mean that that was not like a as kid friendly as the first one was. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it was. It had its kid-friendly moments, but overall, I mean, the the char- the ghost from the painting that was like, um, you know, a king, vicious warlord or something in medieval mm-hmm. times. I mean, that's like that's basically like Vlad Dracula right there, you know? Right. Just like you know, same type of dude who's like just a ghost in a painting that's like surviving, and I mean, he's trying to take the baby you know, and put his soul into it, like, so he can be resurrected and, and wreak havoc amongst man once again, you know, I mean, it's like a, it's not like, you know, as kid-friendly as the first one was, even though that one wasn't super kid-friendly, it had more of, like, the family tone, um, but it was, it, both were great, um, yeah. but they, they had, they were great because of mainly Bill Murray, then Aykroyd, and and um, you know the 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 writing of you know Aykroyd and all that in in making them what they were, you know and yeah, and they were the Saturday Night Live guys, so there was a big huge interest in the eighties right. with all those Saturday Night Live alumni being in the movies. That was the big thing, you know. It was a Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, cast member type movie, you know, which was right. m- mainly it's. A big attraction and the big draw was that it was those guys, you know. Right, which uh, I actually have a funny story about myself here for a sec. Um, my dad uh, is from uh, Long Island, um, and he actually uh, worked at the building that was SNL um, before it moved to wherever it's at now, uh-huh. and um, he told me that. He got a chance to meet, uh, well, he worked the elevator system, so he got a chance to meet um, Aykroyd, uh, Bill Murray, um, Gilda Ragnar, Gene Wilder, um, Chevy Chase, like the the original um, cast members of SNL, and Mm -hmm. some weren't the nicest, but he said uh, Aykroyd, Gilda Ragnar, and Gene Wilder John Belushi and Bill Murray were some of like the nicest people he's ever had a chance to meet. Yeah, I worked with them. Um, I guess it was '86. I uh, got with um, uh, Steve Martin's old manager. Started working with me a little bit. We were going to do big things together, and uh, so uh, he. Through my agent at APA, they got me a meeting with Lauren Michaels, so they flew me out to New York, and um, I met with them the next morning, and it was weird. I brought him to the office, I started telling him what I was up to, and, uh, you know, making these shorts and making dark seduction, and, you know, I was there to make, I didn't know if I was going to be a cast member, or if I was going to be a writer, or if they wanted to see me about making short films, so I started talking about my filmmaking first. 
even though I was pretty well established stand up at that time. Um, and then I got into some stand up stories, and then like you know, okay, he looked at his assistant, and then he nodded. Okay, that's you know that's enough for now. And so then they took me out of the office into another room, and then he met with somebody else, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was like, what? What's going on? And she's like, well, it's he, you know, he heard you enough for now. And I'm like, what do you mean he heard me enough for now? I thought we were supposed to have a meeting. <laughs> it was like in there for five minutes. And all of a sudden, he's nodding me out. And I'm like, and he didn't even do it in such a way that was like cohesive or a human. It was just like looked at his assistant, and that was it. I was like, what the fuck? And so, um, anyway, I ended up hanging out enough, and uh, I pitched him a few short film ideas, and so they let me stay on as a short filmmaker. So I made two films for them. But... One of them got shown a little later. It was supposed to be on the first episode, but it got bumped for Sigourney Weaver's song or something. So I had let everybody know it was going to be on. Of course, it was a big disappointment, but it wasn't. And then it got uh, put on a little bit. It was called Andy Warhol's 15-second workout. (laughs) And it was just me as Andy Warhol pressing the channel changer on TV. And uh, that was his workout, you know. (laughs) And so... uh, you know, it was really funny, and it got a good response. And then I did another one called Nick Nolte, Never Get Out of Bed. And it was me as Nick Nolte waking up the next morning after a party night. And, uh, you know, the girl in bed happened to be a guy with a wig on, and he's like, pulls out a gun and cocks it, you know, at the end when he figures that out. So, <laughs> you know, it was pretty cool. And uh, so I did those two with them, but the guy who was head of the film department, was just, he never showed up for work. I think he was a drug addict or something. He was just really messed up. He just wasn't professional at all. And it was always a problem. There was always some big problem. And so I just didn't know where I fit in. I didn't want to hang out and find out. I just didn't feel like I was right for that group and that whole political. I just couldn't figure out what was going on. Everybody was vying for something, and I don't know. It was a weird, very strange environment, you know. Uh, they were all kind of a little lost. I seriously don't know how they put a show on the weekend. It just seems so disorganized. Me, anyway. A lot of cocaine. Uh, but, my, dad, my dad, one of my dad's... Yeah, uh, to, uh, or to be a part of it, but I left for the life and they couldn't figure out. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I think it had to do with a lot of cocaine. Um, um, at that particular time, kind of early 80s, partying was a little bit subsided because, I mean, I did a little bit myself and there was like an 80s seven period where it was kind of like, eh, this is kind of enough, but it kind of slowed down a little bit, picked again. And the late 80s. And, right. You know? I know there's a lot of eager male fishbowl fans that would love to hear about showgirls. <laughs> well, there's uh, so many different aspects to it. I mean, um, I don't remember where we were, what we were talking about exactly, but uh, well, I guess we can. The just... thing about it is, I'll say this: the script had, you know, major issues and major problems with the lines. Seemingly, you know, were they supposed to be funny? Was this campy? It was just a little over the top. And so, being that the director was a foreign-born director, he knew it was a little bit askew. But he didn't care. He was going to try to make it work anyway. And so that was his challenge, was to make that script work and not change it. And all the other actors were trying to change their lines because they knew they were a little bit screwy. But he wouldn't let anybody change it. He made everybody do it exactly the way it was written. And so uh, that's why it's, you know, the way it is. It's because the script um, was so... I don't know. I don't know if he was going for comedy or what. I mean, it was just a really strange take on everything. It didn't 
it was almost written like a musical, like with comedy lines in between the dance numbers, you know? Right, right. <laughs> you know, so, and then it gets really dark, so it's it's all over the place, you know? It's about a little dancing, you know, competitive dancing movie, fucking your way to the top, and then all of a sudden it gets, you know, rape and dark and, you know, revenge and all that kind of stuff. I guess they had to go somewhere with it, so... Right. That's where they went, but uh, I can't believe how much of a cult classic it is, and how much they show it on cable over and over again. You know, the yeah, clean version, the dirty version. Rarely does the NC-17 version get shown. There's a middle version that's kind of a cable version that's like an R, but the yeah, NC-17 that, that, that rarely gets showed. It's kind. Of, it's kind of like the Scarface role. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like we can, we are we're only allowed to show that like. Once a year, kind of thing. Uh, right the there is a there is the ultimate version of Scarface that's almost X rated. I think they right. did get an X when it came right. out. Yeah, yeah now, but uh, and and I think Showgirls got an X, but they kind of like made a few adjustments and got an NC seventeen. Right. But uh, my my first introduction to it was the NC seventeen version, mm -hmm. and it was uh, on Encore on demand. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I, I love the movie channels for the fact that you can watch an NC seventeen movie at like you know eleven a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it's like like they had the first Evil Dead on uh, like you know eleven a.m. and like it's it's it says on like on the info NC seventeen and I'm like this is fucking great. Like, this is yeah. why I don't really watch cable that much anymore. And it's like, you know, really the movie channels. Because it's like, where else can you, you know, in your own home entertainment room, turn on the TV, 11 a.m., NC-17? I know, I know. Well, and also there's a big difference between sexual uh, ratings and violent ratings. Because all the sex and... Showgirls was kind of, you know, pretty flashy and not real, like, you know, down and dirty really doing it, but more of like, you know, this is all pretend and right. we're all having a good time making a movie. Right. You know, and, or just showing various parts of women in the, in the clubs and whatnot. I but mean, uh, granted, granted, the, uh, the uh, lap dance of all lap dances that... McLaughlin gets. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty, pretty, that's pretty graphic. I yeah, mean, that was pretty racy. That was yeah. pretty sexy. Yeah. But still, that compared to a violent NC-17, I mean, exactly. you can get away with as much violence as basically you ever want to do and still get an R rating. You got to be really doing some blood and guts to get an NC-17 for violence. You know? Right. It's like the... Uh, <laughs> you the, the, gotta, the, you got to be blowing heads off of bodies, or I don't know what you got to do, but it's, it's got to be pretty intense, you know? Like, I'll give you the perfect example that I kind of wish was NC-17. Like, I get why they made it R, um, but I wish I wish it this was, they just left it NC-17. Um, and this movie came out, like, close, one of my birthday years, um, whenever, whenever the, like, in the 2008 or something, uh, mm -hmm. it was... Uh, Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez uh, first collaboration since Dust Till Dawn um, which was Grindhouse oh and, yeah I've got it yeah yeah, I love yeah, that movie yeah yeah like that That I was reading all the hype on it because I was like this is going to be awesome regardless of what it is and, mm -hmm. and um, they were going to make it NC-17 but um, be, to, to fulfill like a more broad audience um, yeah, they, they cut like a good portion from both movies. Um, oh, did they really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They, wow. Uh, they re, re when they released it on DVD and now Blu-ray, they have the director's cuts of both movies since they decided to what for whatever for whatever odd reason release them as separate films. Um, but there there is director's cuts of both of those movies, and. Mm -hmm. um, especially in Planet Terror, there is so much gore that, that got cut 
from that movie, and, and it only adds to the awesomeness of Planet Terror. Wow, because I went to great lengths to get the original version that I saw in the theater because I saw that they re-released it with two different versions, and I didn't know I didn't know that they added all that footage to each one, you know. Because yeah. I really like the versions that I saw in the, in the theater, and I also like those trailers right. that were at the beginning and in between the two films. Um, Machete was. I'll have to check that out. I didn't know that. I thought they just released them the, the way they were in, in the movie, but uh, so they added quite a bit to each one. Oh, yeah, so. there's there's probably like half an hour of footage cut from a uh, Planet Terror. And I, I forget, I think more like 45 minutes or something, half an hour, 45 minutes from Death Proof. Wow. That's amazing. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Yeah, they were fun. I, you know, I, it's just, that was a very specific time period. Right. And a, and a subgenre to boot, you know. Right, right. I mean, there were like, you know, five, six cities that showed these movies in their downtown movie theaters. Or, you know, they would have some little suburb uh, grindhouse theaters. A lot of drive-ins showed grindhouse movies. But, you know, that was back in the 60s and 70s. I don't, I don't know how the youth, you know, younger people in their 20s would, uh, you know, other than the hearing about it, it was just something that was not, you know, commercial enough to really warrant, you know, a big, super big release. I think it really didn't make much money at the box office at all, it if didn't, I recall. It didn't, and yeah. the reason I went to go see it was because my dad told me all these awesome stories about how he was tripping on acid and, and went to these grindhouse movies and right. you know, had the most awesome experiences seeing, uh, like, Dr. Strangelove and Eraserhead and, and Clockwork Orange in a certain order that was like the best psychedelic trip he had. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like growing up, I'm like, this sounds awesome. Like, why don't these places exist anymore? And uh, when I was growing up, there was a uh, one theater in an area of Pittsburgh called Oakland. I forget what the theater was called because I was, you know, so young. But it's it was its sole purpose was um, only showing the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and. And uh, they closed it, and I forget what it is now, but it's it's like not not a movie theater anymore. And um, mm -hmm. there's like a f like three theaters left in Pittsburgh that are kind of in the sense of like a grindhouse theater where right. it's like one screen and they show like the old movies. You know, right. There's right. like the the Hollywood Theater in Dormont. Uh, there's the Oaks Theater in an area called Oakmont, and um, uh, there, there's uh, one other theater after I forget the location, but um, you know the, Pittsburgh still kind of has tries to have that like revival of like the old in in a sense, you know, because mm -hmm. they're kind of like that old Steel City town. Yeah, I mean there used to be when I first came out to Hollywood, there was all these theaters on Hollywood Boulevard that were grindhouse theaters, and um, they would have a double feature. And it would be some, like, you know, Vietnam movie and then some, uh, you know, pimp movie or, you know, hooker movie, like the Happy Hooker right. three or four. And then, uh, you know, uh, Guy Kills Gooks in Vietnam five. <laughs> you know, right, and it was right. like, you know, it was like a weird combination. But they would also show semi-independent films Canon films, um, you know, films that were sometimes studio films, but just, you know, were real low budget and didn't get a big release. And, you know, they would book them in these grindhouse type theaters. But, boy, you know, it was just really funky. I mean, guys would like, you know, they would just like smoke, they would piss, they would like, you know, the, the theaters were nasty, they didn't clean up after. The shows, they had popcorn and candy wrappers everywhere. I mean, they just didn't give a damn, you know? Right, right. It was like in this weird period where everything was just sort of like whatever, you know? Right, right. <laughs> you know, you know, here's your ticket, and uh, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs>
So, uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Different days, though, different times. Right. Everything now is so corporate and so, you know, we've got to have nine theaters and they've got to show Disney films. And if they show, you know, children's movies, we can't have an NC-17 movie in the chain because somebody might sneak in and see it and that would corrupt their world and they'd never be the same. I mean, that was the fun when I was growing up was going to see the kids movie and then sneaking into the the adult movie, you know, because the theater I went to had two. Then there was a cinema that had two, and I'd always go to, you know, the Elvis movie and then sneak in to see Dr. Strangelove, you know. Right, right. So, you just go to the bathroom, and then when you walk back, you go into the other theater. It's real simple. <laughs> right. Well, it's like, when I, when I was growing up, you know, the, the first R-rated movie that I snuck into was actually Detroit Rock City. And it was at oh, a, okay. uh, one of those theaters um, that, again, is unfortunately no longer there um but it was like right down the street for me um and uh it was one of those theaters that uh had like you know four screens and they later on before it closed added like two more screens onto it um Mm -hmm. it still like one of those small theaters and i remember you know figuring out like how am i gonna do this like, like it can't be, can't be this difficult um, to get sneak into an R-rated movie. So I, I, I using my, you know, dad's devious tactics in a way uh, that he taught me to get, to get, you know, kind of what you want in, in terms of going to see an R-rated movie. Um, I looked at the times for a PG-13 movie, which I knew I could get into, and they coincided around the same time in terms of starting. And I went with my buddy. We basically just snuck in, you know. Nobody really cared, you know, or, or saw or anything. And we ended mm-hmm. up seeing these two hot girls I knew from school, and went out with them afterwards. And you know, got lucky that night. So first R-rated movie. There you go. There you go. I remember when I first saw Rocky Horror Picture Show. It was. Uh... It was uh, maybe 76. I think it had been out as a midnight movie for a little while. But, uh, yeah, I got the girls going big time. I went with these two college girls. And, uh, yeah, I got them all, got them all hot and bothered and uh, ready to rock and roll. And it was, like, really incredible. I was like, wow, this is like the ultimate date film, you know. Right, if you can, right. <laughs> if you can get a girl to come see this movie, you might get lucky, you know. Right. Now, if only yeah. we can get them to sit and watch Showgirls. Yeah, yeah. Showgirl. Well, they tried to get Showgirls going as a midnight movie, but it's a little long for a midnight movie. It know? is. It is. Midnight movie. I mean, I think um, Rocky Horror is even an hour forty or something like that. Right. But, uh, I think a good ninety minutes and maybe even eighty-five minutes is about the right length for a midnight movie because you're starting late anyway, and then so it's like one thirty by the time you're done. It's yeah. It's, you know, people are starting to get kind of tired, you know. Right, maybe save it for like a Saturday night. I guess I spoke to you, it was before my premiere of Dark Seduction? Was it yeah, before? It was before, yes. Oh, okay, great, yeah, yeah. Well, it went really well, and uh, we had about 130 turnout, and um, they loved it. I mean, they laughed all the way through. I was really blown away by their reaction. They laughed at stuff that I didn't even know was funny and, um, you know, really got into it and really enjoyed it. And so I was very, very pleased. And um, we've got a uh, video on demand and DVD coming out September, October. And then um, I don't have the exact dates, but I'll find out and let you know. And then uh, and then we're going to continue to see if we can, uh, as the momentum builds, we'll continue to see if we can get it. In, uh, in different theaters around the country as a midnight movie. So, awesome. I can give yeah. you the information for uh, the Dormont Theater in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, okay. They, they would totally be down to host something like this. Um, and, you know, like, I would love to, to have a Pittsburgh showing of that because there's definitely enough fan base to, uh, to go see something like that. I think you would definitely get a really good turnout. 
Okay, good, good. I will um, send you the link of the promotional video that we did with some of the premiere footage and some of the, and uh, you know, just all about the film. And, uh, and maybe you can send them that as well. So that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I just came from there for a, a, a speaker presentation my former teacher was doing on uh, screenwriting and uh, promoting his new book. So um, it, it's, it's definitely in, involved in, in uh, you know, the, the film industry and all that, and especially in Pittsburgh. Like, they host more than just uh, showing films and all that. So it would definitely be right up their alley to, to host something like this. Cool, cool. Yeah, it's a lot of work making these movies and getting them out there, but uh, at least we have the avenues of the VOD and the uh, you know and the DVD still. And I hope they don't do away with the Blu-ray and the DVD because I really like that format. I don't, you know, either one is fine for me. I don't, I don't I'm not that picky visually that I need the Blu-ray collection or need to replace my movie collection with right. Blu-rays. I mean, you know, I still buy DVDs and it looks fine on my big screen. I don't have to have it you know, super HD or anything like that in order to be satisfied, you know. I kind of like it softer anyway, you know. Sometimes on the super HD, the 4K, it's a little bit much. It's almost like, eh, it almost looks glassy and a little bit too sharp, you know. Right. I mean, I will say I did just uh, purchase the Predator trilogy on Mm Blu-ray. And, um... You know, I, I, was, I was watching uh, several Schwarzenegger films for inspiration for uh, one of the scripts I was working on. And right. And I have to say that, the because I have uh, Predator on DVD, like the special edition they did. And right. And I now have the trilogy on Blu-ray. And, you know, the picture, in terms of the quality of the, the visual picture of Predator versus the DVD versus Blu-ray. Um, it's it's pretty astonishing how clear um, in everything the, the, the imagery mm-hmm. is. In, in the yeah, some movies that it does make a difference, but uh, I will, uh, others, mm, I don't know, not so much. I mean, you know, especially things that are shot pretty well on film that are pretty brightly lit. Right. I, I think those kind of add up to be very similar on DVD and Blu-ray, but things that are like dark and uh, need a little bit more enhancement sometimes maybe look better. Uh, like Alien, right. I think, looks better on Blu-ray, you know, right. probably. I, I have the anthology of that as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I seriously love that movie. I saw it not too long ago, and it just really holds up so well, you know. And the line tension is so great in the film, you know. It really is, and I, I'm so excited for what's what they're now doing. Um, I think it got an mm-hmm. August or September 2017 release date for Alien Covenant, um, mm-hmm. which is Ridley Scott's uh, second installment of a trilogy he's going to do leading up to the original Alien. Oh, is it before the original Alien? Yeah, it's like Prometheus is was the first installment mm-hmm. of... A, and now what's what's going to be a trilogy of prequels that he's going to do leading up to the original oh, alien that he did. Oh, I see. Okay. And and then also Neil Blomkamp um, is working on uh, an an alien fan uh, fiction project, which is supposed to um, also come out another twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. Uh, which mm-hmm. is going to supposed to act as if Alien Three and Alien Resurrection never happened, and it's supposed to be a direct sequel to Aliens. Um, and they're supposed to be talking about bringing uh, Michael Bean back as Hicks. Um, oh Lance, wow! Lance Henriksen is supposed to come back. Um, you know, it's supposed to be. I, I'm not sure. If I don't he, remember if he lived in that. Did he live through the end of that? Uh, Did Hicks make it through the end? Yeah, Hicks was the the one he got hurt. Uh, his face uh-huh. got burned uh, by the acid, but he made it to the end. And okay. it was in Alien 3 that they killed him and Newt off, and, and it left Ripley alone again. So, oh, okay. Um, when she was in, like, the penal colony. Um, but now, now, like, they're acting as this film, this fan, because he, like, saw 
um, Alien um, and Aliens as a kid, and because uh, he's like in his early thirties, mid thirties, and um, right. he uh, just loved um, Aliens and came up with it. You know, was working on a script, just a fan fiction. Um, mm -hmm. Now, since he's like accomplished, and we are in the age of rebooting shit. Yeah, um, sounds like a good idea, yeah. you know, I mean, that one was very successful too, you know, and it had its own unique style, right. and the uh, camera did its own, his own thing with it, making it more military and more, uh, you know, peekaboo kind of, you know, right. uh, suspense, and uh, it worked well too, you know, I thought right. it was a really good sequel. I mean, yeah. it's like really inspirational because I kind of had the same idea growing up watching you know, aliens and everything. So now I'm actually working on trying to reboot um, it, the EVP movies just done properly. Like, like in terms of like, uh, you know, like my biggest issue with the Alien versus Predator movies is that one, they, they all should have been R, not just the second, but also that they should have taken place in the future um, like all the comics and video games do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I didn't never see any of those. I didn't. I didn't see those. But uh, well, cool. Well, what else do we want to talk about? All right. So, uh, Showgirls is off the list. Uh, I guess we can talk about uh, Man on the Moon. Man on the Moon, the Andy Kaufman story. Um, I knew Andy and a lot of his friends, Bob Zamuda, who was his co-writer and co-partner in a lot of uh, things, and uh, also one of his other writers, Mel Shearer, and um, <clears throat> used to see him come over to their house and, you know, work on different ideas. And he's a very introverted guy, very... Uh, very shy in a lot of ways, but then when he was on stage, he was, you know, pretty much the opposite. He was, he was really had balls and was very brave in his approach to things, but he was the, uh, kind of the ultimate, ultimate magician in the fact that he fooled the shit out of everybody with, uh, you know, a lot of the things that he did. Um, I saw a show where he came out as Tony Clifton and opened for Andy Kaufman as this, you know, hack Las Vegas lounge singer, and just with a little bit of makeup and a wig and glasses <clears throat> and, a, and a, tu a bad tuxedo, and nobody knew it was him. They were booing him. They were, you know, wanting him to go and yelling for Andy. We want Andy. And it was like, what the fuck? Are you, you really, you don't get it? This is Andy. You know, it's like, right. it was just... It was so weird because the audience just didn't get it because he had such a different personality. But I mean, you know, anybody that knows anything about, you know, comedy and theater, it's like, yeah, that's the guy, you know. Why would he be opening for Andy Kaufman? Why would some, you know, hack lounge singer be opening for Andy Kaufman, you know? <laughs> it was terrible and mean. It was just hilarious that they just bought it hook, line, and sinker, you know. But, uh, yeah, he did some amazingly funny things. He had this one bit called The Mask Magician that Zmuda played. And at the very end of his tirade, exposing all the magic tricks to, because he got kicked out of the magic union and he was on a tirade about it. Andy, he, he did a sword swallowing bit. He put the sword all the way down his throat and Andy just popped it down a little bit farther and the mass magician just like spewed blood all over the stage, <laughs> like he'd cut his throat or stomach <laughs> open. <laughs> it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I laughed until I cried. It was so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, it was really great. And uh, yeah, he was just amazing. He did some really good stuff. And, yeah, we lost him way too way too soon. I, I don't know what he would have gone into uh, had he kept going, but uh, yeah, it was too bad. Right. Well, I and I thought I thought Carrie did a really excellent job because they oh absolutely they had about three or four different stars that were vying for that role, and I'm glad they went with Jim Carrey because he really really nailed it. You know. Right. I mean, I think that's truly one of Carrie. I think that is Carrie's best performance. It might be. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I really think yeah. he should have gotten an Oscar for that. Um, mm -hmm. He really did. I mean, I was watching like the backstory on it and everything. And um, what was the uh, the wrestler that he uh, won the, 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 the match with and was supposed to, you know, went on a yeah. Tonight Show and yeah. everything? Well, it's like the wrestler um, confessed uh, during the interview that because um, Carrie was going around, um, you know, being such a method actor that he was trying to be Andy, um, that he, like, you know, annoyed, basically, um, the wrestler so much that he hit him actually harder in the face during that scene where he slaps him that he actually hit Andy Kaufman. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jim was in character. He stayed in Andy the whole time that he was off camera. I was uh, on the set watching him at the improv one time, and he came over, and, yeah, he was totally in Andy. He was consumed with it, you know. Except at the rap party, he finally dropped it all and, you know, was back to his normal self. But, right. uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing. It was a pretty amazing performance. I mean, Jim, Jim is one of my all-time probably my favorite comedian of the 90s. I mean, I'm so mm -hmm. happy to see him getting back into doing crazy Jim because he, he really toned it down for like almost like the 2000s through the 2010s. And, yeah. you know, it's not like I didn't like seeing him in Bruce Almighty and, you know, um, some of the other films he's, he's done uh, during that time. But, you know, nothing was better than seeing like what outrageous character is he going to play next and mm -hmm. I, I thought um dumb and dumber 2 uh was such a awesome um you know for for not for acting as if like the prequel never existed um and in, in making like a direct sequel to the original film and the way they kind of followed it up like right in the beginning with the catheter scene is like you know classic Harry and Lloyd. It's like you know, yeah. It's like especially you know, twenty two years have, has passed, and these these two actors, Jeff Daniels and Jim Carrey, you know, like are so easily back in the, the roles of Harry and Lloyd, the two idiots, you know. And, and and I love this film so much because they go even further into the fact that it's like they kind of have more than dumb luck, you know. Um, it's like, mm -hmm. like, if, like, yet again, when they're supposed to be killed, you know, a, a train comes out of nowhere and, you know, kills uh, Ron Riggle's character, who's about to kill them, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's more, it's like other examples of like fate kind of inter, right, like a higher right. power kind of watching over them. Um, but it's, it's, but it's still like they're ignorant idiots. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they're they amazing actors. Both of them are incredible. Well, what do you say, man? Are we uh, good to go on this deal? Yeah, um, if, if, uh, if, you're, if you have to go, uh, we, can, we can end it here. Um, I had uh, one more question, if you want to talk about one more movie real quick. Sure, sure, go ahead. Um, Starship Troopers. Yes. Um, if... You were the news reporter in that film and one of the most, again, many iconic characters uh, that appeared uh, in and out of that film. Um, what, what was that like to work on? That was a little more intense. Um, instead of looking around uh, like on Showgirls and seeing beautiful pits everywhere, we were in a um, Indian burial ground in Wyoming. And uh, there was just these uh, huge rock formations everywhere with uh, rattlesnakes uh, crawling around that had been removed, but yet were still there. Because, you know, you can't get them all. Right. And so they had to remove all these snakes in this big pit of uh, rock formations. And uh, we shot at night, and it rained every, like, two or three hours. So everybody had to get out of the rain, and then they had these big fans that dried everything out again. And uh, it was intense. They, I, they almost took my head off on this one part where my 
where I'm in the mechanical bug being tossed around and uh, my head almost, you know, got taken off on a rock formation that they, you know, zipped me by. But uh, luckily I came out unscathed and, uh, and um, you know, it, it worked pretty well. It was actually a very memorable little, it wasn't a huge role, it was like three scenes, but uh, everybody that, uh, that has seen the movie always remembers those parts, you know. So I mean, that was kind of fun. And, uh, yeah, it's a classic. I mean, I'm, I'm so lucky to be in that. Uh, you know, I think it'll be around a long time. It's like a cult classic as well, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm definitely, like, as we talked about, you know, Paul Verhoeven is one of my favorite directors. And um, if, if I, if I, if hopefully this, this does happen, because I saw, was the, I think you might have shared this, um, that Paul wants to uh, direct Schwarzenegger in um, the, the next, the, the final, like, Conan installment. Oh, Okay. I'm not sure. If that I heard you. something about that. Yeah, I yeah. did hear something about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that that is what I think Paul's next film should be. Um, it would be great. That would be great. Yeah. I think I think he's the only director with the visual talent to represent an old, you know, Schwarzenegger as Conan. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with, with how. Uh, Conan the Barbarian, Conan the Destroyer, and I always kind of counted Red Sonia as like the third Conan, even though it wasn't. Um, but right, you know, I, I if you if you talk to him, tell him that Sam Fish says, "Do it. You you are <laughs> okay. you are the one." Yep, I will. Yeah, he pops up at screenings every once in a while, and uh, I see him sometimes there, and. Uh, Hopefully he'll uh, he'll make another big movie and uh, get back on the boards. I think he did something in Europe here recently. I don't know what it was, but I think he did a movie coming out that he shot over there. So we'll have to wait and find out what that is. Yeah, I'm excited to check it out regardless. Definitely, definitely. Well, cool. All right, well, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, swimming in the bowl. Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry it took so long to get back and finish it up, but that's showbiz. Right. That's showbiz. We finally got it, and uh, I would definitely like to start uh, once this is I get this posted, which um, I'm going to try and have this out uh, within the next two weekends. Um, okay. Since we it, it took so long to get the you know to finish up here, but um, I definitely like to start you know a segment with. Uh, Greg Travis called uh, the Fishbowl's movie segment, where we just talk about movies, because I like having uh, conversations about movies with people in the industry. Definitely, definitely. All right, Sam, well, thank you so much, brother, and uh, have a good weekend and what's left of it, and yeah. uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, sounds good.